Excuse me, guys. There it is. Good morning. Good morning. So we had the opportunity a few weeks ago to discuss the four streams of the United Church of Christ. And this morning, we are discussing the first part of the fifth stream. The Afro-Christian Convention is the fifth stream of the United Church of Christ, and it was acknowledged and affirmed on September 23rd, 2022. I'm gonna present Acknowledged as the fifth stream? Yes. I'm going to present uh, a lecture form of, of a review of the first few chapters of the book, but I hope that you will listen to it as more than a lecture. Chapter one, Flowing from Africa. The Reverend Dr. Yvonne Virginia Delk has served for over 60 years as an educator a preacher, an organizer, a prophetic voice, leading the fight for human and civil rights for people of color, children, and the poor throughout the continents, throughout five continents, excuse me. She is currently a member of the Board of Trustees for Franklinton Center at Briggs and lives in Norfolk, Virginia. Dr. Delk reminds us how important it is to remember our past. The black church has her roots in Africa, places like Angola, Zimbabwe, Ghana, the Nile, living water where we are reminded of the scripture, John 7, 37 to 39. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, All who are thirsty should come to me. All who believe in me should drink. As the scriptures said concerning me, rivers of living water will flow out from within him. Jesus said this concerning the Spirit. Those who believed in him would soon receive the Spirit, but they hadn't experienced the Spirit yet because Jesus, yet since Jesus hadn't yet been glorified. Africa, where the people first encountered God. The Sankaba Spirit is one of empowerment. Thanks. On the cover of the Afro-Christian Convention book, we have two emblems. One is an emblem for the United Church of Christ. The other one is just behind that emblem. It is one from Ghana. It signifies a bird that has its talons rooted into the ground going into one direction, and its head is turned in the other direction with a gold egg in its mouth. The word Sankaba literally means to go and fetch it. The implication is that we must learn from our past and secure our future. This is the emblem, an emblem and a symbol from a land that gave birth to humanity. The black church has always been 
a people rising up with dignity and with purpose. From 1619 to 1865, the black church was a testimony against slavery, the dehumanization of African people, as well as the racist behavior of white Christians. And we're talking about racism, America's original sin. In 1892, the Afro-Christian Convention was organized as an independent black church. It grew to 150 churches, 25,000 members, 185 ordained ministers, and 150 Sunday schools. The Convention of the South in 1950 was a conference of congregational Christian, of the congregational Christian denomination, and it was composed of black congregational churches and churches of the Afro-Christian Convention. So I'll say a little bit about that later, but the idea is, keep in mind here, this is 1950, this group is made up of all blacks. It seems to be contrary to the UCC idea that we always have diversity. This is black congregationalists and black Afro-Christians. In 1965, the Southern Conference of the UCC was formed, which was the beginning of integration and assimilation of black congregationalists. While the UCC was officially formed in 1957, Delk tells us that it was several years before the Afro-Christian Convention really felt that they were part of the UCC. Why? Delk tells us it is because the Afro-Christian churches were looked upon as objects of the UCC's mission rather than subjects of the denomination. Objects of the UCC's mission rather than subjects of the denomination. The fifth stream's roots are in justice, liberation, and love. And from this stream would emerge black theology. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing my arrow here. Okay. Chapter two flowing from the Christian movement. The Reverend Richard Taylor was the former chair of the Historical Council of the UCC. Some of you shared with me that you own some of his books. He wrote over 12 books and several articles on the history and the demographics of the UCC. He was also the co-founder of the Rhode Island Religious Coalition for Marriage Equality. One of the books by Richard Taylor. Thank you. The 17th century immigrants brought ideas of freedom and independence, as well as new expressions of Christianity. From this mix was born an indigenous tradition that only required the love of biblical principles and the heart and spirit as Christian followers. Richard Taylor relates a story that when he was just 13 years old, he was excited when he heard that the United Church of Christ was about to emerge. He had already heard that this was going to be a body that was going to be intentional about bringing Christians from different walks of life and different backgrounds. He attended a UCC church in college, the first congregational church in Marietta, Georgia, where the Reverend Frank J. Wright was the pastor. His pastor, who was from a Christian church background, told him stories, stories of the Christian church, especially after the Revolutionary War. Stories like James O'Kelly, who was a Revolutionary War vet and was an engaging Methodist preacher and helped form a group known as the Republican Methodists, free thinkers, free speakers, 
There were many debates between believers and, and lots of discussion on church governance and polity. Chapter three, flowing from the hush harbors. Reverend Brenda Phillips Square is currently serving as the director of the Afro-Christian Preservation Project of Franklin Center at Bricks. She is also co-pastor of Beecher Memorial Congregational United Church of Christ. Through the ages, the narrative of the Afro-Christian history is spoken by ancestors in whispers of encouragement and empowerment. It echoes the spiritual gifts of faith, hope, and resistance. Resistance that sustained Africans through the harrowing Middle Passage and enslavement, propelling them from the secrecy of hush harbors to the prominence of independent black congregations. What were these hush harbors? There were places of secrecy. They might have been going into the woods, into a cave, into any place where they felt that they could be their authentic selves and share part of their unique heritage from Africa. Enter the Afro-Christian Convention, a beacon of resilience, flourishing in North Carolina and Virginia from 1866 to 1950. Again, comprised, comprised of 150 churches and 25,000 members. It supported institutions like the Franklinton Christian College, the Women's National and Home Foreign Convention, and a Christian publishing company. Mm, that wasn't right. Visionaries like Yvonne Delk and others were active in missions in Zimbabwe and South Africa and they witnessed the same indomitable spirit that stirred the early black church in America. Delegates from the Christian Fellowship UCC carried gifts to Mozambique Council of Churches, establishing several African missions led by black Americans. The Afro-Christian Preservation Project of Brenda Square was an initiative born from this legacy diligently preserving the history of 66 United Church of Christ congregations that were uniquely linked to the Afro-Christian Convention. Oral histories, particularly those of Afro-Christian ministers and directors, are meticulously collected here. The project sheds light on the crucial role played by Afro-Christian women following the United Church of Christ merger. The American Missionary Association, or the AMA, was born in 1846. It emerges as a non-sectarian, anti-slavery society, a collaboration between black and white abolitionists. Founding churches and schools for people of color, the AMA left an indelible mark. Personal correspondence from luminaries like Frederick Douglass and Mary McLeod, McLeod Bethune are stored in these AMA archives, and they reveal untold stories of resistance against enslavement, racism, and Jim Crow. However, the Afro-Christian story has often been omitted. It would be my guess that for many of you, you are hearing about this history for the very first time. Neither the Library of Congress nor the broader history of the Black Church in America adequately encompasses the contributions of the Afro-Christian Church. 
Brenda Square recognized that the UCC's impact and the need to preserve all its stories embarked on a mission to honor this indigenous American legacy. Providence, UCC. This church was established in 1854, likely as a Hush Harbor congregation, for it didn't have its first building until 1872. This church stands as the oldest Afro-Christian congregation, tracing its roots to pre-Civil War gatherings. The North Carolina Conference, formed in 1873, was likely the first conference of blacks in the South. It marked a significant milestone. From pre-Civil War gatherings to independent churches and conferences spanning 11 states, from the 1850s to 1967, the Afro-Christian journey unfolds. In 1931, the Congregational Church merged with the Christian Church. Yet Afro-Christians and Black Congregationalists remained segregated. So repeating this again, in 1931, we had the Christian Church and Congregational Church merging. But again, there's no diversity there because the Afro-Christians and the Black Congregationalists are in a group by themselves. It took until 1950 for them to, to unite and form the Convention of the South. In 1957, this union merged with the Southern Conference of the UCC, which is now one of the most diverse conferences in the United Church of Christ. A covenant in 1965 solidified the unity of the Southern Synod of the Evangelical and Reformed Church, the Convention of the South, and the Southern Convention of Congregational Christian Churches. Despite their cultural southernness, they held fast to their diverse ethnic backgrounds, where some were British, some were German, and others were African. The Afro-Christian activism of the later years led to groundbreaking national reports on toxic waste and race, introducing terms like environmental racism and environmental justice. The Commission for Racial Justice, through its work, brought about a transformative era. The Franklinton Center Museum, housing oral histories, sermons, and archives, becomes a repository of sacred wisdom. These records unveil the Afro-Christian faith's resistance against enslavement and Jim Crow, illustrating how they built churches, sustained communities, and empowered leaders who continue to spearhead struggles for equity, justice, and peace. Here we have a picture of the Franklinton Christian College in 1899 with the staff and uh, with the faculty and the uh, student body standing outside the college. The Franklinton Center at Bricks. As with everything in with the Afro-Christian Convention, there was a struggle, and there certainly was a struggle for freedom and the pursuit of education. Chapter four, flowing from education and freedom. Vivian M. Lucas was the former 
education, educative director of Franklinton Center at Brooks. She has extensive ex experience serving disenfranchised and distressed communities through leadership positions within the UCC, the U.S. Department of Commerce, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. The saga of the Franklinton Center at Briggs unfolds as a testament to the pivotal role that education, training, power, and freedom play in the Afro-Christian tradition. Rooted in the sacred practice of baptism, the journey takes shape through the baptismal waters administered by a pastor, Joseph D. Hill, to a young soul known as Vivian Lucas. Joseph D. Hill, instrumental in founding the Franklinton Center, envisioned a haven for African-American UCC youth during the 1970s. This Christ-centered program, blending wisdom from the Afro-Christian churches and the national UCC setting, became a crucible for shaping future leaders. The youth imbibed teachings on God, on church, on family, and the profound responsibility of engaging with community, society, and yes, government. Oh, excuse me. The Franklinton Center, born out of a fervent quest for education and justice for formerly enslaved Africans, traces its roots to the Black Christian Church that was founded in Franklinton, North Carolina in 1871. Nestled on 250, square, uh, 250 acres, once inhabited by the Tuscarora tribe, the land transitioned from indigenous homestead to plantation. Under Joseph John Garrett's ownership in 1863, it became a site of labor for enslaved Africans working on tobacco, wheat, cotton, and other crops. It wasn't until 1895 that a Ju Julia Brick, a white Congregationalist aided by the AMA, transformed the property into an educational sanctuary. This sacred space witnessed the repentance for America's original sin of racism, and it became a refuge for socially oppressed, emotionally weary, financially poor, and academically uneducated former slaves, according to Lucas. The story unfolds in the late 1800s, with abolitionists supporting the establishments of schools for the formerly enslaved. The North Carolina Colored Christian Conference and other black conferences contributed, while Northern Christians and the American Christian Convention played significant roles, the Northern Christians providing some funding and the American Christian Convention holding the title. The Franklinton Literary and Theological Christian Institute evolved into the Franklinton Christian College, the picture that I showed you earlier that was founded in 1891. It became the educational cradle for many Afro-Christian church leaders. In 1930, the college closed, but it would continue to serve as a vital hub for Afro-Christians. In 1954, the Franklinton Center moved to Whitakers, North Carolina, marking a transition facilitated by J. Taylor Stanley and pastors of the Afro-Christian and Black congregational churches. The Franklinton Center emerged, providing ministerial training, retreats, Christian education, institutes, and more. A transformative moment in 1954 saw the AMA deeding 151 acres 
to Franklinton Center at BRICS. The exact number was supposed to have been 150.9. With the understanding that they would, main, would remain close ties with the congregational and Christian churches. In that same year, the former BRIC school was leased to the state of North Carolina. So keeping in mind the BRIC school is congregational. The Franklinton Center begins as Christian. The two combined formed the Franklinton Center at BRICS. The mission of the Franklinton Center at BRICS was born from the fervor of black people of faith, and it is meant to provide a, a nurturing home for local, national, and global programs and organizations seeking liberation through education. The United Church of Christ has been a pillar of support, aiding disenfranchised individuals. The center has served as a rare haven, had served as a rare haven even in the 1960s, where blacks and whites could coexist in the pursuit of justice. Social justice activities kept the center open year round and gave it year round relevance. In 1968, Leon White, an Afro-Christian pastor, assumed the directorship of the Southern Regional Office of the Commission for Racial Justice. The Reverend Dr. Ben Chavez, a UCC pastor, played a pivotal role in the release of the Wilmington 10, a group of wrongfully convicted civil rights activists. Dolly Burrell, a central figure in the environmental justice movement exposed environmental racism during protest. The center's impact extended globally as it organized a trip to the very first national people of color environmental leadership summit in 1991. This is important for many reasons, one of being that it also influenced a United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So one of the points here is that the Afro-Christian Convention was very much involved in the work, in the work abroad and in the work at home. The Franklinton Center at BRICS with educational programs focusing on rural justice, community development, environmental racism, LGBTQ rights and workers' rights operates under four pillars. Rural community development and education, African American historic development, land-based innovation, and retreats and social justice conferences. Vivian Lucas had served as a director from 1987 to 2021. The center's enduring legacy stands as a space where justice seekers strategize, conduct civil rights work, train advocates, and celebrate victories. In 2015, governance responsibility finally returned to the Board of, Trans uh, Board of Trustees. They adopted the Sankhava symbol, the one that was mentioned earlier in 2019, which reflects the center's relentless pursuit for justice for over 150 years. Chapter five, the flowing from American and Christian theology. Yeah. I'm sorry, African and Christian theology. I had a verse for you to read, but I forgot what it was supposed to be, but if you would like reading it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4, 1? Yes. Is this where it goes? Okay. Please, yeah. When I next observed all the oppressions that take place under the sun, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no one to comfort them. Their oppressors wield power, but they have no one to comfort them. Thank you. The Reverend K. Ray Hill 
is a certified Christian educator for the UCC. Uh, Reverend Hill has served as an instructor for the Southern Conference Pastoral Leadership Development Program. Is that long enough? As well as for courses in UCC history, polity, and theology, and also a boundary trainer for the UCC's Southern Conference. Theology in the Afro-Christian tradition emerges as a profound synthesis of African religions as along with Christianity, a healing bomb meant to empower. It is a commitment to foundational Christ-centered principles enveloped in a holistic African perspective, fostering dignity, self-determination, and a resolute independence in the face of challenges posed by racism and oppression in both the church and the wider world. K. Ray Hill, a product of the Afro-Christian tradition, navigated his life's journey within its contours. His various roles within the UCC find their roots in this tradition, and he perceives his call to service as deeply intertwined with the understanding of self and scripture, echoing the biblical adage that to whom much has been given, much will be required. In, in an America centered on racism, and with a white church that is complicit in this very injustice, there has been a concern to make a difference. The Afro-Christian church has been a bastion of resistance from its inception, first against the enslavement and later against white supremacy. And it became a sanctuary for affirming identity and uncovering gifts. This black theology bears the imprint of both Africa, where the divine was first encountered, and the Christian church, the conduit through which former Africans connected to the United States. Its core tenets include an unwavering emphasis on faith, trusting and praising God amid oppression, rooted in the belief that God surpasses all circumstances, embodying hope and deliverance. Dependence on the Holy Spirit became foundational for all endeavors, guiding people towards unity with God's purpose and direction. The centrality of Jesus Christ resonates throughout this theology, forming the nucleus of almost every message. From the aftermath of the Civil War to the formation of the United Church of Christ, the Afro-Christian Church maintains distinct characteristics, a steadfast commitment to independence and autonomy, sounds familiar, a dedication to fellowship and community, Simplicity in organization, worship, and mission. The pastor does this, the congregation does another, deacons do a certain work. At a deliberate, unhurried pace of service, disregarding the constraints of time. <laughs> The Afro-Christian understanding of the Christian Church's five cardinal principles elucidates their distinctive approach. One, the Lord Jesus Christ is head of the church. This Christocentric worship, deeply connected to African experiences, permeates every facet of their expression, from singing, preaching, shouting, to dance. It is a gift to the United Church of Christ that infuses faith with a fervor and joy, a gift to the UCC. Number two, name is Christian. 
designating themselves as followers of Christ rather than conforming to worldly standards. I want to emphasize that uh, Trinity uh, United Church of Christ, part of their motto is unashamedly Christian. Number three, scriptures as rule of faith and practice. The Old and New Testament serve as the guiding principles for faith and practice consistently applied to personal Christian morality and ethical behavior. Four, Christian character for membership. Membership is contingent on reflecting a life that mirrors obedience to living in a right relationship with Christ and a just relationship within the world. Embodying their faith in God's power and the courage to always obey the call. And five, private judgment. Every believer is vested with the right and the duty of private judgment. Not judging your neighbor. Private judgment. Articulating the gospel from their unique perspective and framing it in the context of personal struggle. This theology remains unwaveringly rooted in African tradition and fiercely resistant to white supremacy. Afro-Christian ministers consistently ch challenge the status quo, bringing a Christian message deeply rooted in the African spirit to touch the lives of everyday people. And this ends for today, the first part of the fifth stream of the UCC, the Afro-Christian uh, Convention. Uh, we'd like to open the floor, however much time is left, uh, for any comments or questions. Um, we'll go from there. Let me stop this. Yes. Do you think the Afro-Christian expectations uh, show up in the Pilgrim Congregational Church? How do I think it shows up here? In the Pilgrim Congregational Church. Mm -hmm. um, that we're here, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in various aspects of, of, of worship, because I know this is leaning toward music. Um, so uh, that would certainly be part of it and uh, open to uh, having diversity in preaching from the pulpit. Uh, that has certainly been important here. Anything you want to add? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, and it's a little unfair because I, I took the second half of the book and in the second half of the book, um, they you talk a little bit about um, the struggle of the uh, Afro-Christian stream and people who, uh, and the flow of that stream into a predominantly white denomination. Um, and I would say it's a struggle that uh, Yvonne Delk and others would say continues to this day. And I think one of the ways it shows up at Pilgrim, frankly, is in the struggle. Um, and, that, and that struggle is, one would argue from the book, and I think it's true, it, it, is, it is a gift. That struggle in itself is a gift. One of the um, points that's made by uh, one of the many people who contributed to the book is that um, the, the despite the struggle, and we'll talk about some of that next week, but you can probably imagine some of it. Despite the struggle, the gift is that the Afro-Christian stream is still here. The people did not pull out, and it was not easy. They did not welcome them always with open arms. Anything that you saw reflected in the greater society was reflected in the UCC, only it was probably perceived to be a tad more offensive because they were Christians who were open and welcoming and wanted diversity, so it's a little bit rougher when somebody who you know says, I don't like you, does something that says they don't like you, you kind of go, well, you, you didn't like me. Uh, but when somebody who says, I love you, does something that's hurtful, it, it hurts in a different kind of way, right? Um, 
but they're still here. And I think a living testament to that is our new general minister. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely incredible when you look at the, our history, and we'll talk more about our history as a denomination, that Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson is the general minister of what is still a predominantly white mainline Protestant denomination. Um, and, and that is because of the challenge and the struggle. Um, one of the, the things I was going to say next week, I may say it again next week, um, is the, the Afro-Christian convention, when it came into the UCC, brought the, you know that saying, the, the job is to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable? That's part of what the Afro-Christian stream brought. Yeah. And that, I think, is still alive and well in the UCC um, and here at Pilgrim. Amen. Amen. Uh-oh. <laughs> David has a question for Wilbert. Uh, <laughs> Even my friends are scared of me. <laughs> um, this is actually kind of coming out of what you said a second ago and out of the latest question. Um, when you look at like the black the black Christian tradition of pressing for social change, you know, and you think about groups like the National Baptist Convention and to a lesser extent like the Church of God in Christ, what you're describing here is the not unlike other, you know, sort of black Christian efforts in that way, is in a predominantly white space, right? So it may be a black group, but it's still part of YCC, which, as you just mentioned, like we really white, we really, we really white. I'm so white, I can't even say it. I don't fudge it. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, traditionally, most Black Americans live in the South, and the UCC has never really had as much of a presence there as it has, like you know, in the Northeast and the Midwest, compared with the NBC or the culture or whatever. So, and I really, I'm not trying to ask you like talk about compare what you talked about to something that you didn't actually come here to talk about. I don't mean to to to, to do that, but do you have any sense of how this effort is different doing this within the UCC in a place that's not really heavily strong in say Mississippi, South Carolina, whatever, and also as a white denomination compared with doing it within a Southern black space or institution? It's a long question. <laughs> Could you rephrase? The, the question part? Yes. <laughs> What's it like doing social justice work for this organization in a predominantly white, predominantly northern institution compared with doing it in like the NBC or the Koji, which is predominantly black and southern? Okay. You could have just said that, could yeah. Okay. I do, uh, I do think that it's not necessarily easier, but it is, um, there, there is definitely um, of support. The interesting thing to me since I've been part of the United Church of Christ is uh, is that there's always eagerness to, to do the right thing. Uh, I don't think we're always on board for actually doing the work, but we definitely want to, uh, we're definitely supportive of, of the, the idea. So I think uh, <laughs> That's pretty faint praise there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you from the local level, from the state level, and from the, the national level, uh, I, I've discovered that anyway. Yeah. So, so, well, so get, you're part of getting into, please come back next week, even though we're talking about some of it now. Um, you're, you're, it's different, but I think it's different in a couple of different ways that are actually important. So one of the things we'll talk about a bit next week is, is um, as Wilbur was talking about, the, um, the, the black folk that came together in the UCC were actually fairly diverse. I know, kind of blows your mind. Black people have diversity within being black already, but that's just the way it is. And um, one of the things that, that I think, part of what's different about doing it in the UCC, I think, versus doing it where probably the black coalition is of more of one mind, is that there's power somewhat in that diversity. So what you had was a lot of the black congregationalists were from the North. 
and the Afro Conve uh, Christian convention were mostly from the South. And that meant some economic differences, some background differences, some ed educational differences, and how you get things done differences, a whole bunch of differences that came from uh, their heritage and also where they lived. In order then to get ju social justice work done um, that's aimed at people of color in the UCC, you tend to both have to form two coalitions, right? One is you have to form a coalition of black people. Or, as well as other people who care about it, but you can't make the assumption that all black people are of the same mind. And so you, when you bring those two minds together, I think you get some different solutions. You also get some different strategies for dealing with people who are not of the same mind, who are black or not, right? So it's a little bit about, um, think of it as the blending the best of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And so what you get is, you know, they, they, they had things they agreed on, they bet about them different ways, they had a common objective, just came at it from some different experiences and those things. So I think the other part that Wilbert mentions, though, is, um, and you'll see this, there's continual organization in, of people who want to do this work that crosses boundaries, um, that, that are oh, sort of extra organizations that are founded, whether it's the CJ, a uh, community, uh, I don't know, a lot of that community. Oh, no, sure, right. Yeah, that one. They, 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 at the national level, because there are people committed to supporting doing the work, the UCC supports spinning up groups of people who want to do the work, who don't necessarily live next to each other, don't necessarily go to the same church. They're not, all of the ways in which people normally group, like, you know, we live in the same community, we should hang together. If you want to find a group, though, to do certain kind of works, you might need to find people from all over the country or all over the world. And, and the UCC is supportive of funding and facilitating those sorts of organizations which then actually are do a lot of those things. So they, they not only don't stand in the way, but they will actually financially support it. And that is the benefit of we'll form a committee, mm -hmm. right? I mean, forming a committee is not a small moment. If you form a committee and, and um, fund it and empower it to do the work, because somebody's got to do that. That's great. And I'm going to need to exit at this Yes, because if you would like to have music yeah. <laughs> in our service. Um, so do do come back next week. We will cover for part two. For part two we'll cover some of the same ground. Um, but the primary question that comes up in the second half of the book, and you'll you'll see in our discussion, is what does it mean to be uh, black in a predominantly white denomination? And what does it mean to be black and Christian in a predominantly congregationalist? organization. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. For those of you at the top. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, you have to have a Shh. Shh. Congregational congregation. So okay. if you check up on one of those, that's the book.